Welcome in Rose City to Soccer Made in Portland. Brian Clark back here with Chris Reifer after a few weeks off here. I disappeared into South Korea and Japan for a couple of weeks, but I'm back. Still a week after returning, feeling a little bit of the, the jet lag somehow. Um, but but what a trip. It was, it was so much fun uh, experiencing the food and culture over in that country uh, and and. Travel is, is always a valuable experience, but this was definitely one of the more valuable experiences of my life, uh, which included visiting some some fine folks at PDX Tap Room in Shibuya, Tokyo, uh, some, some diehard Timbers fans out there, including uh, a fellow American traveler, soccer maiden Portland listener, Xander, who... Uh, hit me up via email before I got to the to the bar and was like, "Hey, I'm going to be there." And so I, I met him, met some other folks who had relocated to Tokyo, uh, who had had built out the the Timbers Army Tokyo Yosaku uh, supporters group out there. Um, just just a really fun time overall. Bizarre to be in Japan and be in a bar with a with a cardboard cutout of Diego Chara being marched around. I mean, that's that's a testament to to the passionate nature of this fan base that it is able to exist and thrive halfway across the world, uh, if not fully across the world, uh, five thousand miles over the Pacific. So, you know, happy to be back. Kept up with with most of what happened while I was gone, particularly the obviously that Philadelphia game that I watched at PDX Tap Room uh, for the Timbers. But an eventful few weeks, Chris, for for both teams, and not always a positive few weeks for for either team particularly the timbers lost three straight uh and then the thorns uh two of three dropped with of course sam coffee's late goal saving the day and and saving a point in the thorns most recent game um big news obviously uh of the of the few weeks was for the thorns the extension for sophia smith signed through next season with an option for her to join another season after that um allowing her the flexibility that she has more than earned as as one of the best players in the world but also keeping her in portland which very clearly was important to her and is something that we've talked about on this podcast as being vitally important for the thorns franchise as they head into the future so let's just start there um so signs that extension um seismic moment obviously for for the thorns uh, as they enter this new era under the Bethals, uh, your your perspective on on Soph signing up with the Thorns? Yeah, I mean this is major and monumental and extremely good news for the Thorns. Uh, you know, and that frankly outweighs what has been a disaster class on the field in the first three weeks of the season. Uh, but this good news outweighs that by some distance. And, you know, it's true that it is functionally only a one-year extension, right? Because the, the second year is a player option, so it's, it's at Soph's option, not the Thorns. Uh, so functionally, it's a one-year extension where they've got her guaranteed now through 2026. That is, so, you know, I mean, on one level, okay, it's one year. That's not exactly the, you know, long multi-year extension that I think a lot of Thorns fans would have loved, but probably wasn't realistic. But that year is a really, really, really big year. It's an enormous year, given everything the Thorns have. I mean, the biggest challenge, the biggest problem that they had with re-signing Smith was that they had this new ownership that was just showing up, that was saying that they wanted to change a lot of things in the club for the better. But the question was whether they were going to have the runway to actually be able to show that and to convince Smith that she should invest her future in it before she had to make a decision about where that was going to be. Because a year, when you're talking about the timeline for building a practice facility and, and sort of overhauling the infrastructure of the club, a year is not a lot of time. And this gives them the runway that they need now to be able to not just tell Soph what they want to do, but to show Smith that this is what the club is going to look like in the future, and this is why you should wager that the prime years of your career on this club it, that's a big decision for smith you absolutely understand why she would want to go into that decision with the greatest amount of flexibility possible and you absolutely understand why you know she she wouldn't want to go into that based on you know some vague 
promises of this is what we want to do. Uh, but she'd want to see kind of the, the proof in the pudding, so to speak. Oh, uh, and now they have the opportunity to do that. And so I, I think that this one year extension, it, it is only a one year extension, but it is a big, big, big year, uh, that they've bought themselves with this. And, and frankly, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful statement from Smith that she's interested in what they have to show, right? Because if she wasn't thinking that a longer extension was possible, if the club was in a place that she was ready to buy into, she wouldn't have done this, right? She would have gone into free agency. There's no reason not to. She would have gone into free agency this year after the Olympics, an Olympics where she very well may raise her profile even further uh, and instead of doing it the year after. If she didn't think that that was going to be a, a realistic possibility for the Thorns to be able to convince her that this is the place she should be for the long term. And so it's, it is a vote of confidence from Smith in the new ownership. I think it is a huge feather in their cap uh, to get this done early to avoid what would have been the NWSL equivalent of the Otani free agency in, in, in Major League Baseball, right? Uh, you don't want to be the Angels in that position. The Angels do not like being the Angels today, uh, having been in that position, and you don't want to be that team. And they've at least now given themselves some runway to avoid that. And so it's massive news. Uh, it's, it's a big deal uh, to get done. Uh, it shows that, that the Bethals are, are serious and they're moving. Oh, and it, it, it shows that Karina LeBlanc was able to, to get that across the line, which is, which is an important win for her after an offseason where I think a lot of people were at, at least, you know, raising eyebrows at, at a lot of the moves that the Thorns were or were not making. Uh, so I, I, I think it, it is cause for a lot of optimism off the field for the Thorns. Uh, and and that's that's really exciting. Yeah, and and it was a major investment too. You talk about it being a success for the Bethals. Um, the previous NWSL record contract, Mallory Swanson, was about reported at about half a million dollars a year. This is apparently this, the new record. We don't know the exact number, but that I was mean, a foregone conclusion. Yeah, that had to be a foregone <laughs> conclusion, mean, right? Like, like the like that blank on the contract, Soph got to fill that in. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. They just they it was it was a blank. They slid the paper across the table. They handed her a pen and said, "Write down your number." Yeah, we um, had previously so. <laughs> used the phrase on this podcast, "Back up the Brinks truck," right? And they yeah, absolutely what Soph wants, Soph gets. Yeah. Like that's just yeah. how it goes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and she got it. And so that's a, that's a big piece of it. And I think what she said after signing the extension is is of particular importance and something to keep an eye on into the future. Um, obviously you have her locked up now, so you feel good about that. But even when you're looking down the line at, will she pick up her own option? Um, obviously you have to, to show that you have the same sort of vision as she does for winning and for building the franchise out in the vision that, you know, she and, and other great players around this league have. Um, but, but the thing she said about Europe was really interesting to me because that had been something that, you know, you think back to the, her little sideline conversation with Sam Kerr, where she, I think people overheard her say something about Europe. We aren't a hundred percent sure, but um, there, there's always that thought that great players will take time to go over to Europe and have that experience and, and feel that it is an elevated experience as compared with NWSL. Um, Lindsay Horan is somebody that has been very outspoken about that. Crystal Dunn had that experience herself with Chelsea. Um, but Soph, speaking about that, said that she doesn't really agree with the idea that great players need to make that move in order to, you know, take that next step in their career. Now, if there's a whole heck of a lot more money to be made over there and there's a, an opportunity to to join a, a winning team and elevate herself and take on a new challenge then yeah maybe she'll do it down the road but right now it seems like she truly believes in the nwsl in general and is taking this wait and see approach with the thorns about what are they going to do to enter into this new era of nwsl and continue to lead uh with her obviously being at the forefront of that i think so statements about europe should just serve as a reminder to people that the dynamic between NWSL and the leagues in Europe is not the same. It is not the equivalent of the dynamic between MLS and sort of the top European men's leagues. I mean, MLS is an, is an inferior league. 
unquestionably. Yeah, yeah it's period. not even close co- compared to, to you know La Liga, La Liga and Bundesliga and uh, even Ligue 1 and certainly the Premier League and and those. I, I mean, I mean, it's it's an inferior league, plain and simple. I think the the styles between NWSL and and the top European women's leagues are different. And I think you can definitely experience different things. And frankly, I, you know, I mean, if and when we sort of get the global global Super League, the the, the, the true sort of Women's Club World Cup or, or, or whatever they're going to call it, we'll probably see some of these top teams square off in more competitive environments and like weird things like the International Champions Cup. Oh, um, but I have a decent amount of confidence that NWSL teams are going to hold their own. Uh, in in that kind of competition, I think frankly NWSL is very clearly the deepest league in the world. Uh, the top European women's leagues tend to be very very top heavy, uh, where they'll have a few very good teams and then a lot of not very good teams, and you see just a lot of really really crooked score lines coming out of some of those league games uh, that you don't see here. And you know, I, I think there are stylistic differences, but the NWSL is not an inferior league to those opportunities. And so I totally get where Smith is coming from, right? I mean, yeah, of course, you're going to listen to opportunities uh, in, in that you're going to have internationally. Uh, if one of those big teams comes calling, you're, you're not going to tell them, no, absolutely not. You're going to listen to what they have to say and, 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 and weigh the opportunity. But there's just not the same sort of mandate if you are a good player in NWSL to go to Europe than as there is in MLS. Like a good young player in MLS, if you want to advance your career, you kind of have to go international. That's just not, it's not the same on the women's side. And I think that's basically what Soph was saying, uh, that, that there are perfectly good careers to carve out in NWSL that are at the top of the game. Uh, and she, if that's going to be her path, she can choose that. But you know, I, I think more than, you, you know, you reference the player option, more than asking whether Smith is would p- pick up her player option for 2026 or not, this opens up the opportunity for them to talk this t- again this time next year, or maybe next winter, about a longer extension. And hopefully, I think the plan for the Bethals in these next 8 or 10 or 12 months is going to be to get shovels in the ground on a training facility to have tangible progress toward that and a date like a move-in date uh, where they're going to be able to occupy their new training facility with new grass fields and 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 all of that and i think it's to find a clearer on-field direction than they have now as well Uh, and if they can do those things over the course of the next eight or ten or twelve months I think then they go back to to Smith and they say, hey, look, here's the direction of the club. You see it now. It is happening. We are going to be moving into the training facility in X number of months. We are doing these things on the field that are going to put us at the top of NWSL for the foreseeable future. Oh, we've got a coach you're bought into. We've got a GM you've bought, you've bought into. I mean, all of those things. And you say, now let's do the four-year deal. Again. The, the the money blank is still a blank. We will once again slide the paper across the table, hand you a pen, and let you fill in that line. <laughs> but, you know, you see, if, if you can come back a year from now and sell her on the club, I think that player option is not the question. It's whether they're going to be able to sign another extension uh, for, for the long term based on what they've shown her their, uh, of their plans for the club and whether that's a project that she wants to be a part of. For sure, and I think that's a good transition into talking about what has happened on the field for the Thorns over the last few weeks, which uh, (laughs) is a little bit less of an exciting and positive story maybe than this uh, than the Smith extension. Um, Obviously, they lose two in a row uh, to Kansas City five to four, which was just wild whipping back and forth footy, and then obviously the one zero loss to Gotham preceding a, a 2-2 draw to, to Rossing Louisville, which uh, was thanks in part, in large part, 
to Sam Coffey's heroics at the end with an absolute goal of the week, goal Lotso <laughs> for her. Um, and just really cool. I, I just love when Sam Coffey scores goals, just as an aside. Like she's somebody that that does so much else for your team that is so consistently excellent that her scoring goals is just like icing on the cake. I just love it. And she's obviously a, a fun, fun person to follow. Um, just a, just one of the one of the better personalities on the team. So that was a great moment, but you know, a lot to examine and pick apart and criticize, frankly, over the last three weeks for the Thorns, who have not started the season up to their standard by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, let's be honest, one point gained against Racing Rossing Louisville at home uh, is two points lost. Period. <laughs> For a team of the Thorns ambitions, that's two points lost. And that comes on the heels of at least a point, if not three points lost, uh, against Gotham at home. That's a game that the Thorns, given the way the game played out, I mean, Gotham is obviously the, the champs, right? And they made yeah, a lot but of they were short the summer. They were shorthanded. But they were shorthanded. Won that and game. the Thorns, yeah. frankly, played in a way where they should have won that game. And they found a way to lose it. And so, you know, I mean, th this is a, a pretty dark moment for the Thorns on the field. Fundamentally, I mean, we, we can talk about some of the individual performances. We can talk about some of the individual mistakes. But fundamentally, I mean, we can even talk about some of the individual selections that I think have been, in a few instances, borderline bonkers. Oh, I think Mike Norris all but admitted mistakes at the end of that, the, the, the game against Louisville, in which he sort of said, <laughs> sort of acknowledged that he should have been starting Hina Sagina. I mean, it didn't take, it, that wasn't a galaxy brain take. That feels like right? a no-brainer. That's one yeah. where, you, even if you don't watch the games, which I was only really able to watch part of what was happening over the last couple of weeks, seeing that Hina was not starting, I was just like... And, you know, I mean, the, the cardinal sin with that was starting Sink over Sugita in, in, in Kansas City. That was, yeah. that was a, a stroke of madness. Yeah. Um, to, to not put it lightly. Uh, and so, you know, I think... Yeah, I mean, so there are lots of those kinds of things to zoom in on. Fundamentally, I don't understand the game model. I don't understand why they're playing the way they're playing. And I worry that it's just Norris being doctrinaire when and not sort of looking objectively and honestly at his team and playing in a way that suits the team. Mike Norris wants to possess, right? He wants to to build with the ball and he wants to imbalance teams with the ball and 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 he really wants to carry the game. A, that's not how teams are typically successful in NWSL. We've seen a pretty solid pattern in NWSL of, of the teams that are successful being teams that are really lethal in transition and looking to play for those moments. We haven't really seen a team dominate the league by, I mean, really since the, the courage teams in the, 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 you know, late 2010s, um, five or, or seven years ago, we haven't seen a team sort of dominate the league by, by trying to play with the ball a lot. And even those courage teams weren't necessarily doing that. And, and so the way he wants to play isn't a way that has been particularly successful in NWSL. Okay. He's trying to, to zag where the rest of the league is zigging. I get it. Kind of. But how many times do you have to be burned by it? <laughs> and, it, I mean, like, look, this, the reason the Thorns were so successful in 2022 is because they had multiple clubs in the bag. When the game called for playing in transition, keeping their lines a bit more compact, and then getting folks like Sophia Smith and Morgan Weaver into the open field, they did that. And they did it lethally. They could also carry a game when that's what it called for and, 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 and do that. But that wasn't the only club in the bag. And that's not the way they came out to play in every game here. It's just like the thorns want the ball and they want the ball all the time. And they're opening themselves up. They're exposing their central defense and central midfield in possession. Uh, and they're not super clean in possession. And that's just creating a bunch of situations every game. <laughs> that they have to manage in space and they're getting eaten alive. 
And the reason I just fundamentally don't get the game model is when you look at the talent on the field, this actually is a team that seems fairly well suited to be a little bit more compact defensively and to look to play in transition, right? Sophia Smith, in addition to having tremendous pace and all of the qualities that she has, she's an absolutely devastating player when she's holding up the ball, right? She's stronger than every center back in NWSL. Uh, And when she is in space, isolated 1v1, either with her back to goal or facing up, as a defender, you're already dead. Like you, like like you are a dot, and she is Pac Man. <laughs> like it's over. Oh, uh, Morgan Weaver is is maybe the most devastating. Certainly one of the most devastating off ball runners in NWSL. And I don't understand why they're not sort of approaching more games by saying, "Hey, look, we're going to keep things compact. We're going to keep Kelly Hubley and, and Becky Sauerbrunn from being exposed in space. We're going to give uh, a little bit more support than we've been giving to." Uh, our fullbacks, uh, Marie Moeller and uh, and uh, Rana Reyes. And when we turn you over and we're going to have sort of really clear, identifiable, uh, you know, spaces in which we're going to try to turn you over. We're going to make the few defenders that you have staying back choose between whether they want to cover self and cover space. You can't do both. You got to do one of them. So what are you going to do? <laughs> Uh, and I, that's the game model that makes the most sense to me. I mean, you've got a back line that has, for understandable reasons, I think struggled when they're stretched. You've got a goalkeeper who has struggled to manage space um, and to get those hard decisions right when you're having to manage situations in which your center backs are running back toward you. And you've got some pretty green fullbacks. And frankly, you've got a central midfield that is light defensively. Sam coffee is a, is a really good, really good six. Um, I wouldn't say she's like an overwhelming ball winning, uh, presence, but she's a, a, a solid one. But other than that, there's the, you know, and, and, and other than that, there's not a ton of defense in that central midfield naturally. And so, keep things tighter, be more organized and let teams open themselves up and expose themselves to Sophia Smith and Morgan Weaver and even Hina Sugita in space. Right. And that also frankly uses well, Sam coffee's in my view, best attribute, which is her passing range and her tempo. So I don't understand why that's the game model. I don't understand why they're trying to go out and die in beauty and, and, and carry the ball all the time. I I, I don't think it's been that effective. And I think they've opened themselves up and I think they're really getting eaten alive because of that. Do you think it's, it's sort of an overreaction to the way that they played last year? Because there was stretches last year where it was just unadulterated chaos, right? Like just like end to end play, throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes they won high scoring games, but most of the time they were really exposed at the back. Do you feel like, like on the part of Norris, on the part of his staff, do you think that this, the way that they're playing this season is, is serving as a sort of reaction to that? I think they're falling into many of the same traps. I okay. mean, the, the reason that a lot of those games turned into track meets is because they were stretching themselves in possession, right? And then they would lose, they would lose the ball and then it's, and then it's a track meet, right? It's a, it's a race back toward your own goal. Um, and I think they're, Falling in, I mean, certainly against uh, against Kansas City, that stadium, by the way, was amazing. That was that was an awesome atmosphere. We haven't talked about that. That that deserves uh, a nod. That was historic and and great. Um, but I mean, it, like that that was that was the bad thorns from twenty twenty three, right? When when they would just let games just turn into just absolute chaos, and and. That I mean, that was that was it. That's what we saw. And, and like Sophia Smith is going to get hers, right? You could put Soph on a field with ten squirrels to 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 borrow a phrase from Liam Ridgewell, and she would still get hers because she's Sophia Smith. But I th- I mean, frankly, I think that's kind of what we saw in the first certainly half hour or so, certainly fifteen minutes against Louisville. Um. In, yeah, I mean, I think they managed the game against Gotham pretty well, except they didn't 
manage the one moment in which, oh, Gotham got <laughs> the Thorn center backs running back toward goal. And they they managed it horribly. They managed what should have been a should have been a pretty straightforward situation. The kind of goal you can't really give up in a high level game. They gave up because they got exposed with their center backs running back toward goal again. And I I mean, if I was Mike Norris, if if I was managing this team, I would just try to avoid those situations because I can feel like Soph is still going to get hers, and Morgan Weaver is going to get hers playing in transition. And you know I. So, yeah, I, I don't get the game model, and I think it's really hurting them. Yeah, I mean, they, they now have this opportunity with a couple of weeks off between games here. Obviously, the last game was on, on March 30th against Louisville, and then uh, the Courage is the next one for them. That's on the road at, at the Courage on the 13th. A um, little extra time probably for, for Mike Norris and company to, to look inward and, and figure out with in collaboration with the players, you know, what it is that needs to be done in terms of those tactical adjustments. I, I think that, you know, you raise some some strong points in terms of like, you know, the approach with with a team like this. Like you I really do feel like you have to take advantage of of the personnel that you have, particularly when when you lack depth, because, you know, if it's not working and then you you sort of change the the personnel, it's I mean, it, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, the circumstances is is what it is um but but yeah that courage game is is big obviously the thorns you know given they've got one point out of these these first three games sitting near the bottom of the standings they need um, points they, they need points straight up and a stretch like this in the middle of the season may not feel as dire as it does at the start of the season because obviously you know having a, a winless record is is never a pretty thing it's never a fun thing and the thorns players like obviously they're not satisfied with this. They're frustrated. They have they have expressed that. Um, there there doesn't seem to be that level of concerning discord, at least publicly, uh, between players, coaches, players, and players so far. But you know, you get far enough into the season, and if these problems aren't addressed, then questions begin to get raised. Right? I'd be worried and, if I was Mike Norris. Yeah. I mean, if we've seen anything from the Bethals, it's that they're they're not screwing around, and they don't they still don't have the luxury of being super patient. I don't think they're going to be incredibly impatient. No, but they don't have the luxury of being super patient and getting things set in the right direction on the field. And I think they've if they've shown anything, it's it's that they are willing to come in and make changes where they see changes that need to be made. And so, yeah, I mean, frankly, I'd be pretty nervous if 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 I was in that that seat. I would feel like it is yeah. definitely warming up. I feel like it's it's this is the prove it season, right? Because you know, there's there's no longer the sort of and and not that Mike in any way was using this as an excuse or that Karina LeBlanc was or anything like that. But there's no longer that potential excuse that you know the the club is in transition and yada yada. Um, this is the, this is the prove it season and, and, um, you know, the standard is very high for this club, not to mention the fact that you're in a position now where you're trying to keep up with the rest of the league as this exponential growth continues to happen. This is a discussion point we've had on, on numerous podcasts, but, um, yeah, that, that adds to the level of warmth of the seat if you continue to to sort of struggle throughout this season. So I'm interested to see how these next few weeks go for the thorns. I think that um, the opportunity to, to sort of turn it around and not let what happened in that angel city game last year be sort of the, the tipping point where things go in the opposite direction, because it, at the end of the season last year, it felt like, sort of like an oh the thorns like the issues that they had all year you know the questions like we got the the sort of answer in that moment yeah. right because they lost that game and then they lose to gotham in, in the playoffs and then you're like oh man like and is... and the, you know they had been wobbling on the tracks for a little while basically since the world cup yeah since after the world cup they had been wobbling on the tracks they fully derailed in that angel city game gotham put them to sort of a a merciful end <laughs> in terms of the 2023 season and 
then they started 2024 poorly. But I, yeah. when you zoom out and you look at both the end of 2023 and the beginning of 2024, there's not a lot to like. Even though yeah. there's still a lot of talent. There's not so a lot much, to like. So much talent. And, and this isn't either of us writing off the thorns by any stretch of the imagination. No, I, no, I know no, there, no, no, no. I know there are certain folks that, you know, they, they live in the moment. They live in the episode, right? They, they think that, you know, this this particular moment and reaction to the moment is somehow indicative of an overall narrative or viewpoint about a team on the part of talking heads like you and me but it's not it's just it's just where the teams are at right now so and speaking of rough moments <laughs> and speaking of narratives and all all that um you know the portland timbers are in, e- in an even worse position over the last three games uh, and not so familiar and and yet it's such a familiar one unfortunately <laughs> um the the defense has been the the obvious thing that has been the struggle uh just we'll, we'll begin with a quote from phil neville as tweeted by Jeremy Peterman uh, yesterday. With the ball, I think we're a match for anyone in this league. Incorrect. If we can sort the other bit out, we can match any team in the league. Arguably correct. <laughs> or incorrect. We'll see. <laughs> the, the other bit being defense. Uh, but <laughs> There's that bit. But yeah, the, the last three games have been a, a real struggle for the Timbers. Uh, it's, you know, three straight losses is absolutely not uh not what this team wanted not what the first couple of weeks really looked like it felt a little more rosy particularly after that opener everybody was just like living in the clouds after they destroyed colorado uh and and there was a lot of you know positive things to take away from those first couple yeah. of games but the last three um it, it's been a hard turn in the other direction um individual players have had their their stretches of of futility but the team as a whole i think is is undergoing not growing pains necessarily but the sort of mismatched early season difficulties it's hard to it's hard to describe but it's it's there's a lot of layered issues it seems with this timbers team so far and i'm wondering what stands out to you i guess about the last three weeks in particular they're not one of the best teams in the league with the ball. <laughs> let's just start. Let's just no. start there. They maybe have, Jonathan Rodriguez explodes, and maybe that can be the case. Look, but I, I they I have I good seen moments yet. and good stretches with the ball. But they have also repeatedly, over and over and over again, had long stretches in which teams totally break, just totally break the Timbers' possession model. Right. And they've done it a few different ways. We saw DC United do it where the Timbers were, I mean, not certainly not dangerous and not super effective consistently with the ball against DC United. They did it with pressure against a DC United team that's A, not very good, and B, was a little bit shorthanded uh, in, in coming into Providence Park. We saw NYCFC do it for the first half hour of that game where they just pressed the living bejesus out of the Timbers, and the Timbers couldn't string a pass together, right? I mean, they, they couldn't string two, three passes together at all. Before turning the ball over, they could barely get it out of uh, out of their half at Yankee Stadium. Uh, the Houston game probably was their best ninety minutes overall, certainly with the ball of the season. But then we saw the Union come in, and after a first half hour in which the Timbers were pretty good, the Union got a goal. They 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 parked the bus, being as shorthanded as they were, and the Timbers were totally flummoxed. Totally flummoxed. It, it, you're not getting totally flummoxed like that if you're one of the best teams in the league with the ball. The Columbus crew, when they've got their folks, are not getting flummoxed like that. They are the best team in the league with the ball. So if you want to start, you know, throwing around, we're as good as anybody in the league with the ball, you've got to be at that Columbus crew level. And I tell you, they are not even close to that. Yes, and, they and absolutely frankly, have stretches in which they look really, in which they are, not just look, are really effective. And frankly, you don't want to like, just just to put put a pin in that previous point, you don't want to get into the territory of we're better than our record situation because that's been I mean we, we, listen, we, we, we spend a lot years, of time in that territory around two here. years of that stuff with with Gio Savarese occasionally using language like that. Ned Grabovoy obviously has has it's, it's used used similar like words in the off season. It just dispense with that. But go on. Obviously, there there's yeah. I just that that in particular. 
it feels like that is sort of the the territory that we're in when we talk about stuff in that yeah, in that fashion. And, and frankly, the first half hour of the Vancouver game wasn't all that different either. The Timbers were bad, not not among the best in the league. They were bad with the ball in the first half hour of that game. So I don't know how you can say that you know when we've got the ball, we're we, we're we're you know as good with the ball as anybody in the league. That's just not true, at least not in any meaningful sense. And and so I think they've got to get a lot better because clearly they're getting exposed in a few different ways by teams. And like games have ebbs and flows, especially road games have, have ebbs and flows. Uh, and you're not going to carry the entire game. And, and, and that's just kind of the reality of soccer and the reality of a competitive league. So I get I I get that. But the Timbers aren't experiencing ebbs and flows in, in games. They're experiencing ebbs and tsunamis. And that's bad. <laughs> they need to figure that out. Uh, and they need to be ready for when teams throw something at them, whether it's a press or whether it's a really compact block or something like, or, or whatever. I mean, they, they've got to be ready for those situations. And they just don't seem to be. And it takes them half an hour to figure things out. And by the time that's over, they're down 2-0. And you're just not, you're not going to win games when you're shipping two, three goals. Period. And and that that's why they lost in Vancouver. That's why they lost to the Union. Um, and you know that, that's <laughs> that's that. Uh, you're not going to win those games. Uh, and so it's it's been a disappointing last few weeks for the Timbers. This really was one of the softest stretches of their schedule of the season. And now what six games in? They're on seven points. They're at one point one something points per game. Very familiar territory. <laughs> That one point if, one if, point if, per game area. If, if I had a nickel for every time Chris Reifer mentioned one point one points it's, per game in the last three hundred and sixty five days. <laughs> yeah, I mean you'd at least have a buck. Right? <laughs> like maybe two bucks. Uh but like I mean that that's not good. And the thing that that concerns me, look, it, but but it's it's six games into the season, right? And so by no means is it time to hit the panic button. But it is time to hit the we've got our we've got to get our spit together button. <laughs> yeah, the adjustment button. Yeah. Definitely should be hit in several areas for because sure. Because these next four games are pretty challenging. They go at Sporting Kansas City, who's had a strong, not overwhelming, but strong start to the season. Uh and then they've they've sort of got got to run the champions gauntlet, right? They've got two, uh, they've got home and home. Uh, against LAFC split by a game at the Columbus crew. Those are the last two MLS cup champions, right? Those, those are the last two MLS cup participants. They were the two teams in MLS cup last year uh, with Columbus winning. And LAFC has had a rough start to the season, but I don't think anybody questions whether the talent is there or not. It certainly is. And you look at four very losable games for the Timbers. And frankly, if they don't come out of those with a couple Results. I mean, if they, you know, I mean, if, if if they lose all four, then you're looking at seven points through ten games, and you're wondering, have they already done it? Have they already done themselves for the season? Yeah, seven losses in a row would be catastrophic. That obviously. would not be good. That would certainly be poor. And frankly, those are all losable games. <laughs> Hot take that seven losses in a row would, poor would be poor. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, Chauncey Billups can come on the podcast and tell us a thing or two about that. But yeah, yes, uh, you he know, can. <laughs> look, look I, I, like it's just even if they pull out one of those games, if they're you're at ten points through ten games, you're not in a good spot. And if we've learned anything in Portland from the last two years, it's that putting yourself behind the eight ball like this early in the season is very bad. It makes it so you basically have no margin for error. And even if you play very well over stretches later in the season, you can still suffer ab the abject humiliation of missing the playoffs. And frankly, the Timbers have, have invested, what, between 15 and $20 million in transfer fees in this roster over the course of the last 18 months. If they miss the playoffs this year, people are losing their jobs. Like, yeah. <laughs> and so like that's that's just I mean that's just happening. So I I think they're in, you know, it's not panic button time, but it's like we've got to start doing it and doing it now 
in a tougher stretch of the schedule than we just had. Because if we don't, we are going to be putting ourselves in the same precarious position that's killed us the last two years. Yeah, and and we talked about the tactics with the thorns and and the approach there. Um, what what are like the biggest issues in terms of how Neville Ball has has looked the last three weeks versus the the first three? What is Neville Ball? Uh, do we not know yet? That's <laughs> I don't that... think we know yet. Okay, but frankly, that was kind of the book on Neville Ball coming in, right? Was that, is we don't not, know. Yeah. That it, well, and 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 that he's not a coach that really imposes a super clear identity on a team. Yes, he has sort of his preferred four two three one. You can modify and kind of look like a four three three if you want to uh, set up, but that he's not a coach that has you know he's not Wilfred Nancy, right? He's not like some of the coaches in MLS that have very, very clear, or even Jim Curtin, uh, sort of very clear ideas about what he wants to impose upon the team. And, and look, I, I think there's a world for that. But if you're that coach, you've got to be really pragmatic. Uh, and I think that's what we're waiting to see. So, you know, yes, it looks like the Timbers want to have, have a decent amount of the ball. I don't hate that. But it's a matter of being able to do that while managing situations where other teams are throwing something at you to disrupt you, because that's going to happen in every game. And you can't let that turn into a tsunami. That has to just be ebbs and flows that you manage the ebbs and then solve the problem. But you can't be doing that from, you can't solve the problem when you're two zero down. And that's what they've been doing the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And looking ahead, obviously, um, you got the you got the Sporting KC game, as you said, the LAFC and Columbus games, and then LAFC again. Uh, the month of April, we talk about you know the pivotal sort of moment for the Thorns. It's it's funny the the sort of you know parallels that are happening right now with the the early season issues with these two teams. This next month for the for the Timbers is a pivotal one, right? Because, um, yeah. Just just to reiterate what you said, the, the, the way that you start seasons slowly, um, that being like a cute little like ha ha trend about the timbers, like that is not it's just, it's just not There's a good nothing thing. ha ha about it anymore. Yeah, right? yeah. At this like, point it's just like, it doesn't have a job anymore because of it. Yeah, yeah, seriously. And and you know, you don't you don't anticipate that Phil Neville is gonna have a a one year stint at the at the helm no, but of, if they the, miss of the, the playoffs, timbers, but but if they miss the playoffs, that's not up that's not up to the standard. And it's um, not out of the question either. I mean, look, how are you if if you're Merritt Paulson after having spent between fifteen and twenty million dollars on this roster in the last two years, if you're at the end of twenty twenty four and you've once again finished in the bottom third of the league, who's safe? <laughs> like I, I'd be pretty upset. I don't know. I mean, I would be taking a pretty hard look at everybody. There are, look, there, I'm not saying this is what the, the Timbers organization is or what their, their feelings are about being competitive, but there are a lot of teams in MLS who claim to care about winning. And the duality of it is they don't, actually sort of care about that beyond a certain reasonable point and the timbers are by no means like the the just desolate uncompetitive sad teams they're not the colorado rapids no they're they're not in that category by any stretch of the imagination they're still filling providence park less so than Ish. last than last year like i think like a 10 percent drop in attendance overall but like the the fan base still exists in a strong way um the the team has been historically much more competitive than most of its counterparts in MLS but but when you when you settle for for stuff like this then that that becomes the question like it is portland in that category and we've talked about this before of the sort of middling we're, we're cool with whatever, as long as the check clears MLS and that's, <laughs> you, you don't want to get in that territory. And I don't think that somebody like Merritt Paulson, who, who, you know, 
has a pretty major competitive streak in him and is a is a guy that you know emotionally involves himself very much in the results of the games as holes in the wall at Providence Park and uh, words that have been heard by fans or otherwise will tell you. Um, he isn't the only one obviously making all these decisions, but and there's a lot of different stakeholders here. But yeah, I... I know that that's not what they want, but the dir- the direction of the club is such that if if these sort of middling seasons continue to happen, then you trend further towards that direction as as MLS increases investment, some of the teams at the top maybe become a little heavier on that front. The Inter Miami's and LAFC's of the world. Yeah, you don't want to fall behind. Simple as that. And I think we know we know that they don't, they're not okay being where they've been, right? Because they spent all that money. <laughs> the reason you spend all that money is to get you out of, out, out of that position. And frankly, there are a lot of teams, they're, they're, like the Colorado Rapids and the San Jose Earthquakes, and, and those teams aren't spending that money. Those are the teams that are okay, that, that are you know, more comfortable with losing. We know the Timbers aren't necessarily comfortable with losing. But if you're spending that money and you're still losing, just notwithstanding that investment, then I think you've got to start asking yourself why that is, why you're trying to win and failing. And, and so, you know, and we're six games into the season, so it's, it's premature to be having that conversation. But if we're 10 games into the season and the Timbers are still around that one point per game benchmark, benchmark, I don't even want to call it a benchmark. It's, it's, it's something worse than a benchmark. Yeah, oh. it's, it's on the bench for sure, but yeah. definitely not not a mark worthy. If... <laughs> yeah, it's a bad mark. Whatever yeah. mark it is, it's a bad one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and and you're still around that spot, then I mean, that's of course the the minds are going to go there, right? Because that's been the experience the last couple of years. Bad early in the season, kind of struggling uh, through the spring into the early summer. Pretty good through the summer uh, and even into the fall a little bit. Um, sometimes even very good into, in, in, into the fall, but still falling short because they have a slip up or two and they were trying to dig themselves out of a hole. And if we're sitting here in a month looking up at the top of, from the bottom of a hole, of course that's where minds are going to go. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'm, you know, if, if they get to the season and it plays out like the last couple, I think that is when the point is, you know, I'm not sure anybody's safe because I would be pretty steamed if I were ownership and I'd spent all that money and I'd made all that investment. And there I was watching the playoffs on Apple TV again. There's been a, a pretty sizable amount, I would say of negativity on this podcast today um i will i will leave our dear listeners with this the cherry blossoms are out folks it was beautiful and sunny yesterday uh it's going to be a little cloudier today a little colder this week that's okay but spring has sprung we have emerged from the abject horrors of January and February, the, the, the dark and stormy nights, if you will. Uh, and soccer is very important to a great deal of people in this city. But it isn't everything. So You can go watch the Blazers, for example. <laughs> maybe not that. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe watch something else if you're looking to improve your like mental. Literally, whatever you do over the next few weeks, do not spend any time watching the Blazers. Uh, hey, that's, that hey, is not the best use of your time. Big, big game tonight against Charlotte, though. That uh, one, one of the biggest of the season. It's huge for lottery purposes. Um, they're, they're a game apart, so, you know, take that L. Rip City, <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, look, I I think there are a lot of, and maybe this is the the reflective sort of recently traveled to Japan person talking, but yeah, there you just uh, touch grass. <laughs> that's that's the that's the conclusion uh, for, from me here. 
uh, on this podcast. Just not artificial turf. No, like don't. a real grass, natural grass. If you don't want to get injured, go try touching <laughs> grass instead. Um, so we'll we'll leave on that note, folks. Uh, want to obviously give another shout out to to the PDX Tap Room in Tokyo. That was that was such an awesome uh, experience, and and to everybody uh, who continually has listened to this podcast, uh, either over there or here or anywhere else uh and is is leaving us reviews we appreciate that um we'll be getting back into the regular swing of things here now that i'm stateside uh so so we'll be keeping up with this weekend's games for both teams uh and into the future so follow us on twitter at soccer maiden pdx at chris reifer at ryan t clark like subscribe review do all that good stuff we'll catch you next week